Today is day six for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 1st through the 7th. I will make an instrument of thee, Alma 17 through 22. Saturday, July 6, 2024, Alma 22. Suppose you were to walk into your branch or ward building and see a sign posted that read, Baptisms, Gift of the Holy Ghost, Priesthood Ordinations, Temple Marriages, $1,000 each, Payment Must Be Made in Advance. The thought is absurd, of course, but it gives one cause for reflection. What would you be willing to pay for the principles and ordinances that bring exaltation and eternal life? What sacrifices would people be willing to make if such things were available only for purchase? Sometimes circumstances are such that the members of the church must make financial sacrifices in order to enjoy some of the blessings of the gospel. But it is not uncommon to hear of saints in isolated areas of the world who save for years in order to take their families to the temple to be sealed. But the cost is a product of the circumstances. It is not because there is a charge for the ordinances provided. Considering the greatness of the rewards promised, it would not be unreasonable for the Lord to require a great deal of money from us as the price of exaltation. But such is not the case. The prophet Jacob told us of the Lord's attitude. Come, my brethren, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come by and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Alma added the same thought to his son Corianton when he said, Therefore, O my son, whosoever will come, may come and partake of the waters of life freely. To say that the gospel can be had without charge is not to suggest that it can be had without requirement. The world's way is to ask for money or goods in return for privileges offered. The Lord's way asks for a different kind of payment. Behold, the Lord requires the heart and a willing mind. To his promise that the gift of eternal life would be had without money, Jacob added this warning. Wherefore, do not spend money for that which is of no worth, nor your labor for that which cannot satisfy. Now you are about to read of a man who suddenly wanted to acquire the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of today's sophisticated generation would likely have called this man primitive, superstitious, and unlearned. And yet, he was a king. He controlled a great number of people, had power over their life or death, and probably had access to great wealth. But in response to the teachings of a Nephite missionary, this man knelt in prayer and offered the Lord the only price required. O God, he cried, if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known to me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee. And what of you? Do you feel a longing to know God better? To draw closer to him? Then ponder carefully the story of this Lamanite king and those who joined in his conversion, for they paid the price and received the reward. Chapter 22 Aaron teaches Lamoni's father about the creation, the fall of Adam, and the plan of redemption through Christ. The king and all his household are converted. The division of the land between the Nephites and the Lamanites is explained. About 90 to 77 BC. Aaron teaches the gospel to Lamoni's father. Alma 22 1. Now, as Ammon was thus teaching the people of Lamoni continually, we will return to the account of Aaron and his brethren. For after he departed from the land of Madoni, he was led by the Spirit to the land of Nephi, even to the house of the king, which was over all the land, save it were the land of Ishmael, and he was the father of Lamoni. Elder Joseph B. Worthland said, Recently I was reminded of how vital it is to always be alert to the quiet whisperings of the Holy Ghost. While on an assignment in Hawaii, Sister Worthland and I visited the land of Molokai. We drove into the mountains to a trail that leads to an overlook. As we walked back to our car, we passed a young man headed toward the overlook. I offered a polite greeting, and from his answer I could tell he was from Germany. I served a German-speaking mission in Austria and Switzerland as a young man. Here was a young man whose countenance bespoke a sincere heart and an approachable personality, and I spoke his language and understood his culture. I felt prompted to open my mouth and introduce the gospel to him, but because other people were around us, our brief encounter was interrupted, and we went our separate ways without my having said a word about the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. I failed to be the missionary that every member of the Savior's church ought to be. As we drove away, I had the disturbing feeling that I had failed in my duty to proclaim the gospel. I remembered the Lord's words, in the Doctrine and Covenants. But with some I am not well pleased. 
for they do not open their mouths, but they hide the talent which I have given unto them. Because of the fear of man, woe unto such, for mine anger is kindled against them. We drove around the island to see Molokai's beautiful waterfalls. After many miles, the road came to a dead end, and we got out of our car to enjoy the beautiful surroundings. We had been there only a few moments when another car drove up and stopped. The young man we had seen on the Overlook Trail got out of the car, smiled, and gave me a warm handshake. As I grasped his outstretched hand, I thought to myself, this time I will do my duty. I don't believe it was happenstance that my wife and I met this young man twice. Our meetings were not chance occurrences or mere coincidence, but the Lord doesn't always give us a second chance to share the gospel. I had failed to follow the Spirit the first time when the still small voice spoke to my heart. I had failed to follow the Spirit the first time when the still small voice spoke to my heart and mind to prod me to action. But when I saw that young man get out of his car later, I quickly made up my mind I would not fail a second time and that I would open my mouth as the Lord so emphatically commanded in revelations that apply to all of us. Each of us has the sacred responsibility to proclaim the gospel. The Savior's commandment applies to all members of the church, not just to full-time missionaries or to returned missionaries. We each have the responsibility to follow the Spirit when it prompts us to share the gospel so that others can come to follow the Savior. We must act when the Spirit speaks. When I hearkened to the Spirit, the young man from Germany responded positively to my message. But it wasn't really my message. It was God's message, brought to my mind by the Spirit of the Lord. Alma 22, 2-3 And it came to pass that he went in unto him into the king's palace with his brethren, and bowed himself before the king, and said unto him, Behold, O king, we are the brethren of Alma, whom thou hast delivered out of prison. And now, O king, if thou wilt spare our lives, we will be thy servants. And the king said unto them, Arise, for I will grant unto you your lives, and I will not suffer, that ye shall be my servants. But I will insist that ye shall administer unto me, for I have been somewhat troubled in mind because of the generosity and the greatness of the words of thy brother Ammon, and I desire to know the cause why he has not come up out of Madonai with thee. At first King Lamoni and his father had hard hearts toward the gospel. Later their hearts were softened, and they believed in Jesus Christ. How did this happen? Help your children discover answers to this question as you review with them Ammon's experiences. They could act out chapter 23, Ammon a great servant, and chapter 24, Ammon meets King Lamoni's father. Or perhaps your children would like to draw pictures of different parts of the story and use the pictures to tell the stories. What did Ammon do to help Lamoni and his father open their hearts to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Perhaps you and your children could think of someone who needs to know about Jesus Christ. Help them think of ways they can be good examples and show love to that person, like Ammon did for Lamoni and his father. Alma 22.4 And Aaron said unto the king, Behold, the Spirit of the Lord has called him another way. He has gone to the land of Ishmael to teach the people of Lamoni. Note that the powerful principles of missionary work shown by Aaron and his brethren as they share the gospel with Lamoni's father, who was king over the land. They were led by the Spirit, verse 1. They respected the king's position, verse 2. They had come to serve, verse 3. They were honest and straightforward, from verse 4. These are fundamental missionary principles for all time and for all places. Alma 22, 5-11 now the king said unto them, What is this that ye have said concerning the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, this is the thing which doth trouble me. And also, what is this that Ammon said? If ye will repent, ye shall be saved. And if ye will not repent, ye shall be cast off at the last day. And Aaron answered him and said unto him, Believest thou that there is a God? And the king said, I know that the Amalekites say there is a God. And I have granted unto them that they should build sanctuaries, that they may assemble themselves together to worship him. And if now thou sayest there is a God, behold, I will believe. And now when Aaron heard this, his heart began to rejoice. And he said, Behold, assuredly, as thou livest, O king, there is a God. And the king said, Is God that great spirit that brought our fathers out of the land of Jerusalem? And Aaron said unto him, Yea, he is that great spirit, and he created all things both in heaven and in earth. Believest thou this? 
And he said, Yea, I believe that the Great Spirit created all things, and I desire that ye should tell me concerning all these things, and I will believe thy words. Aaron needed some common understanding from which to start teaching the gospel to King Lamoni's father. The Lamanites believed in a great spirit who had created all things, so Aaron began with this basic principle in teaching the king. Concerning the Lamanites' belief in the great spirit, Elder Bruce Armakonki said, According to Lamanite traditions, God is the great spirit. It is obvious that by this designation the Lamanites had in mind a personal being. For King Lamoni mistakenly supposed that Ammon was the great spirit. Both Ammon and Aaron, using the same principle of salesmanship applied by Paul on Mars Hill, taught that the great spirit was the God who created the heavens and the earth. Alma 22, 12, And it came to pass that when Aaron saw that the king would believe his words, he began from the creation of Adam, reading the scriptures unto the king, how God created man after his own image, and that God gave him commandments, and that because of transgression, man had fallen. President Ezra Taft Benson explained why Aaron taught the king about the fall before teaching about Jesus Christ. President Ezra Taft Benson taught, Just as a man does not really desire food until he is hungry, so he does not desire the salvation of Christ until he knows why he needs Christ. No one adequately and properly knows why he needs Christ until he understands and accepts the doctrine of the fall and its effects upon all mankind. And no other book in the world explains this vital doctrine nearly as well as the Book of Mormon. Alma 22.13 and Aaron did expound unto him the scriptures from the creation of Adam, laying the fall of man before him and their carnal state, and also the plan of redemption, which was prepared from the foundation of the world, through Christ, for all whosoever would believe on his name. President Henry B. Eyring said, Just as soil needs preparation for a seed, so does a human heart for the word of God to take root. Aaron, one of the great missionaries in the Book of Mormon, knew how to teach that way. You remember how he taught King Lamoni's father, the old king. The king's heart had already been prepared by seeing love and humility in the way Aaron's brother had treated Lamoni, his son. But even with that preparation of the old king's heart, Aaron taught the word of God in a way to emphasize God's love and our need for him. And it came to pass that when Aaron saw that the king would believe his words, he began from the creation of Adam, reading the scriptures unto the king, how God created man after his own image, and that God gave him commandments, and that because of transgression man had fallen. And Aaron did expound unto him the scriptures from the creation of Adam, laying the fall of man before him, and their carnal state, and also the plan of redemption, which was prepared from the foundation of the world, through Christ, for all whosoever would believe on his name. You won't very often have the remarkable result that Aaron had, after hearing the word of God taught that way, in what the scriptures sometimes called the plan of happiness, the old king said that he would give whatever he had to root the wickedness out of him and have eternal life. For Aaron told him to cry to God in prayer for forgiveness. The king bowed down on the spot. The seed was planted. He was doing the will of God. When you touch the hearts of people you serve, you won't do everything exactly the way Aaron did, but you will do some of the same things. You will try to help them feel that God loves them by the way you treat them. You will be humble so that they are more likely to choose to be meek and lowly of heart. You will teach the word of God when the Spirit prompts you, in a way that testifies of God's love for them and their need for the atonement of Jesus Christ. And you will teach them commandments they can keep. This is why you learn to commit those you teach to pray or to read the Book of Mormon or to come with you to a sacrament meeting or to be baptized. You know that when they keep commandments, they plant the seed. And you know that it will grow. Their souls will be expanded. And when that happens, their faith will increase. Alma twenty two fourteen, And since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself, but the sufferings and death of Christ atone for their sins. Through faith and repentance and so forth, and that he breaketh the bands of death, that the grave shall have no victory, and that the sting of death should be swallowed up in the hopes of glory. And Aaron did expound all these things unto the king. President Spencer W. Kimball explained, True repentance is rewarded by forgiveness, but sin brings the sting of death. Obtaining the Hope of Eternal Life Alma twenty-two fifteen. 
And it came to pass that after Aaron had expounded these things unto him, the king said, What shall I do, that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken? Yea, what shall I do, that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, and receive his spirit, that I may be filled with joy, that I may not be cast off at the last day? Behold, he said, I will give up all that I possess, yea, I will forsake my kingdom, that I may receive this great joy. How can I experience the great joy described by Lamoni's father? President Russell M. Nelson taught, if we look to the world and follow its formulas for happiness, we will never know joy. The unrighteous may experience any number of emotions and sensations, but they will never experience joy. Joy is a gift for the faithful. It is the gift that comes from intentionally trying to live a righteous life as taught by Jesus Christ. He taught us how to have joy. When we choose Heavenly Father to be our God, and when we can feel the Savior's atonement working in our lives, we will be filled with joy. Alma twenty two sixteen. But Aaron said unto him, If thou desirest this thing, if thou wilt bow down before God, yea, if thou wilt repent of all thy sins, and bow down before God, and call on his name in faith, believing that ye shall receive, then shall thou receive the hope which thou desirest. Aaron taught the first principles of the gospel. He explained the fall and the subsequent necessity of the atonement. He taught from the scriptures. He encouraged prayer. He led the king to the way of true conversion. What do you feel inspired to do to follow the sons of Mosiah's example? Alma 22, 17 through 18. And it came to pass that when Aaron had said these words, the king did bow down before the Lord upon his knees. Yea, even he did prostrate himself upon the earth and cried mightily, saying, O God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee, and that I may be raised from the dead, and be saved at the last day. And now when the king had said these words, he was struck as if he were dead. Compare what Lamoni's father was willing to give up to save his life, with what he was later willing to give up to receive the joy of the gospel and to know God. Elder Terence M. Vizen said, You'll remember... His initial anger in finding his son accompanied by Ammon, he drew his sword to contend with Ammon and soon found Ammon's sword at his own throat. Now the king said, If thou wilt spare me, I will grant unto thee whatsoever thou wilt ask, even to half of the kingdom. Note his offer, half his kingdom for his life. But after understanding the gospel, he made another offer. The king said, What shall I do, that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, and receive his spirit, that I may be filled with joy? Behold, he said, I will give up all that I possess. Yea, I will forsake my kingdom, that I may receive this great joy. He was prepared to give up all his kingdom, because the gospel was worth more than all he had. What was Lamoni's father willing to give up to know God? How might such willingness help us draw nearer to God? See also Omni one twenty six. And now, my beloved brethren, I would that ye should come unto Christ who is the Holy One of Israel, and partake of his salvation, and the power of his redemption. Yea, come unto him, and offer your whole souls as an offering unto him, and continue in fasting and praying, and endure to the end, and as the Lord liveth, ye will be saved. President Ezra Taft Benson used the example of King Lamoni's father to explain that we must forsake sin to know the Savior and receive joy. I cite for you an example of a man whose life was changed to a more Christ-like life after he earnestly desired such a change and sought the Lord's help. Lamoni's father was a king who had bitter enmity toward the Nephites. A great missionary by the name of Aaron, one of the sons of Mosiah, had come to the Lamanite nation to bring them the gospel. He proceeded to the king's home and subsequently engaged him in a gospel discussion about the purpose of life. Once the king became re receptive to his message, Aaron taught him about Christ, the plan of salvation, and the possibility of eternal life. This message so impressed the king that he asked Aaron, What shall I do that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken? Yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, and receive his spirit, that I may be filled with joy? Aaron instructed him to call upon the Lord in faith to help him repent of all his sins. The king, anxious for his own soul, did as Aaron instructed. 
O God, he prayed, Aaron hath told me that there is a God, and if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee. Now I want you, my brethren, to hear again this humble man's words. I will give away all my sins to know thee. Brethren, each of us must surrender our sins if we are to really know Christ, for we do not know him until we become like him. There are some, like this king, who must pray until they too have a wicked spirit rooted from them, so they can find the same joy. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, speaking of the process of coming to know God, said, We also come to have sufficient faith unto repentance thereby becoming willing to give away all our sins to know God. These may include activities and endeavors that distract and deflect us. Getting used to giving away such onerous things is a necessary first step to prepare us for the giving that constitutes eventual consecration. Among some church members, there is, sad to say, a lack of real faith in the living God and in his plan of salvation. This includes the universal need for repentance and remodeling. Failure to pay a full tithing, failure to wear the holy temple garments, refusal to work meekly at making a marriage more successful or helping a family to become happier, inordinate resentment of personal trials, trying to serve the Lord without offending the devil or the world, being willing to serve the Lord but only in an advisory capacity, failing to sustain the brethren, neglecting prayer, neglecting holy scriptures, Neglecting parents, neglecting neighbors, neglecting sacrament meetings, neglecting temple attendance, and so on. Of such happiness, draining failures, the common cause at the testing point, is the failure to endure it well. When we stop short, we interrupt the precious process of personal development. Many of us are kept from eventual consecration because we mistakenly think that somehow, by letting our will be swallowed up in the will of God, we lose our individuality. What we are really worried about, of course, is giving up not self, but selfish things. Like our roles, our time, our preeminence, and our possessions. No wonder we are instructed by the Savior to lose ourselves. He is only asking us to lose the old self in order to find the new self. It is a question not of one's losing identity, but of finding one's true identity. The submission of one's will is placing on God's altar the only uniquely personal thing one has to place there, the many other things we give are actually the things he has already given or loaned to us. However, when we finally submit ourselves by letting our individual wills be swallowed up in God's will, we will really be giving something to him. It is the only possession which is truly ours to give. Consecration thus constitutes the only unconditional surrender, which is also a total victory. Elder Neil A. Maxwell also said, the almost valiant resemble the valiant, except that they show considerably less consecration and measurably more murmuring. They are less settled spiritually and are more distracted by the world. They progress, but do so episodically rather than steadily and pause on plateaus. Sister Elaine S. Dalton said, each of us will need to take inventory of our habits in our hearts. All of us will need to change something to repent. As King Lamoni's father stated in the Book of Mormon, I will give away all my sins to know thee. Are we, you and I, willing to do the same? Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, We may not always succeed as quickly as we would want, but as we make repentance a constant part of our lives, miracles occur. This is what happens as we see that we really can overcome our sins. Our confidence waxes strong in the presence of God. We kneel in humility before our Father. We tell him openly of our progress and also of our fears and doubts. As we draw near to him, he draws near to us. He gives us peace and encouragement. He heals our souls. As we continue inch by inch to repent, we determine that nothing will hold us back. We will do our part. We come to feel like that great Lamanite king who cried, O God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me, and I will give away all my sins to know thee. With this commitment to who we can become, the spiritual doors swing open. There is a new freedom to feel and to know a freedom to become. Ponder what you are willing to sacrifice in order to know God more fully.
Like Lamoni's father, we must be willing to sacrifice all things to be born of God. In the lectures on faith, we learn the importance of sacrifice in our eternal progression. Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. It was through this sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. When a man has offered in sacrifice all that he has for the true sake, not even withholding his life, and believing before God that he has been called to make this sacrifice because he seeks to do his will, he does know most assuredly that God does and will accept his sacrifice and offering, and that he has not, nor will not, seek his base in vain. Under these circumstances, then, he can obtain the faith necessary for him to lay hold on eternal life. What are some of the things we must do to receive eternal life? While serving in the 70, Elder Alexander B. Morrison taught concerning the sacrifices we must make to come unto Christ. To take his name upon us means a willingness to do whatever he requires of us. Someone has said that the price of a Christian life is the same today as always. It is simple, to give all that we have, holding back nothing, to give away all our sins to know him. When we fall short of that standard by reason of sloth, indifference, or wickedness, when we are evil or envious, selfish, sensual, or shallow, we, in a sense at least, crucify him afresh. And when we try constantly to be our very best, when we care for and serve others, when we overcome selfishness with love, when we place the welfare of others above our own, when we bear each other's burdens and mourn with those that mourn, when we comfort those that stand in need of comfort and stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places, then we honor him and draw from his power and become more and more like him, growing brighter and brighter if we persist until the perfect day. Lamoni's father teaches his own household. Alma 22, 19-21 And it came to pass that his servants ran and told the queen of all that had happened unto the king. And she came in unto the king, and when she saw him lay as if he were dead, and also Aaron and his brethren standing as though they had been the cause of his fall, she was angry with them, and commanded that her servants, or the servants of the king, should take them and slay them. Now the servants had seen the cause of the king's fall, therefore they durst not lay their hands on Aaron and his brethren. And they pled with the queen, saying, Why commandest thou that we should slay these men, when, behold, one of them is mightier than us all? Therefore we shall fall before them. Now when the queen saw the fear of the servants, she also began to fear exceedingly, lest there should some evil come upon her. And she commanded her servants that they should go and call the people, that they might slay Aaron and his brethren. Finally, after Lamoni's father's conversion, the gospel was preached to the rest of the king's household, and lastly to his people generally. Alma 22, 22-26 Now when Aaron saw the determination of the queen, he also, knowing the hardness of the hearts of the people, feared lest that a multitude should assemble themselves together, and there should be a great contention and a disturbance among them. Therefore he put forth his hand and raised the king from the earth, and said unto him, Stand. And he stood upon his feet, receiving his strength. Now this was done in the presence of the queen and many of the servants, and when they saw it, they greatly marveled and began to fear. And the king stood forth and began to minister unto them, and he did minister unto them insomuch that his whole household were converted unto the Lord. Now there was a multitude gathered together because of the commandment of the queen, and there began to be great murmurings among them because of Aaron and his brethren. But the king stood forth among them and administered unto them, and they were pacified towards Aaron and those who were with him. And it came to pass that when the king saw that the people were pacified, he caused that Aaron and his brethren should stand forth in the midst of the multitude, and that they should preach the word unto them. Make a list of principles related to missionary work. Prayerfully identify specific ways you can apply these principles in your life. Boundaries between the Nephites and the Lamanites described. 
Alma 22, 27 through 35. And it came to pass that the king sent a proclamation throughout all the land amongst all his people, who were in all his land, who were in all the regions round about, which were bordering even to the sea, on the east and on the west, and which was divided from the land of Zarahemla by a narrow strip of wilderness, which ran from the sea east even to the sea west, and round about on the borders of the seashore, and the borders of the wilderness which was on the north by the land of Zarahemla, through the borders of Manti, by the head of the river Sidon, running from the east towards the west, and thus were the Lamanites and the Nephites divided. Now the more idle part of the Lamanites lived in the wilderness, and dwelled in tents, and they were spread through the wilderness on the west, in the land of Nephi, yea, and also on the west, on the land of Zarahemla, in the borders of the seashore, and on the west, in the land of Nephi, in the place of their father's first inheritance, and thus bordering along by the seashore. And also there were many Lamanites on the east by the seashore, whither the Nephites had driven them, and thus the Nephites were nearly surrounded by the Lamanites. Nevertheless, the Nephites had taken possession of all the northern parts of the land bordering on the wilderness, at the head of the river Sidon, from the east to the west, round about on the wilderness side on the north, even until they came to the land which they called Bountiful, and it bordered upon the land which they called Desolation, it being so far northward that it came into the land which had been peopled and been destroyed, of whose bones had been spoken, which was discovered by the people of Zarahemla, it being the place of their first landing. And they came from there up into the south wilderness. Thus the land on the northward was called Desolation, and the land on the southward was called Bountiful, it being the wilderness, which is filled with all manner of wild animals of every kind, a part of which had come from the land northward for food. And now it was only the distance of a day and a half's journey for a Nephite, on the land Bountiful and the land Desolation, from the east to the west sea, and thus the land of Nephi and the land of Zarahemla were nearly surrounded by water, there being a small neck of land between the land northward and the land southward. And it came to pass that the Nephites had inhabited the land Bountiful, even from the east unto the west sea, and thus the Nephites, in their wisdom, with their guards and their armies, had hemmed in the Lamanites on the south, that thereby they should have no more possession on the north, that they might not overrun the land northward. Therefore the Lamanites could have no more possessions only in the land of Nephi, and the wilderness round about. Now this was the wisdom of the Nephites, as the Lamanites were an enemy to them. They would not suffer their affliction on their hand, and also that they might have a country, whither they might flee according to their desires. And now I, after having said this, return again to the count of Ammon and Aaron, Omner and Himni, and their brethren.